your word as we hear it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, Pastor Jesse is in Guam, so I'm going to do a, uh, a lesson this morning. It's not a part of his series. Um, just by way of uh, introduction, the Jewish people are the only people to survive culturally out of the complete destruction of their nation. In other words, you will read in the past of different uh, nations that were destroyed and conquered militarily, and by and large, their culture is completely lost. You're just reading about it in history. The Jewish people were completely destroyed as a nation, but their culture, even though they were scattered around the world, their language and their culture survived and then came back as a nation, of course, in 1948. But one of the reasons why they were able to survive as a people and culturally, uh, culturally is the Jews had an amazing ability to rehearse history. And this is built in, you know, the Passover uh, to this day, they call it the Seder. Uh, celebration and part of that is rehearsing history where did we come from and they tell this through succeeding generations so therefore even though they were scattered they held on to their language and held on because they knew where they came from if you don't know where you came from you're actually not going to know where you're going and I, just by way of uh, introduction, remember I've told it in sermons in South Africa, Pastor Robert Polacco and I were in a music store and a young man uh, heard our accents, you know, why are you here, we're pastors, and he said that he attended the AFM Apostolic Faith Mission, and I said to him, oh, founded by John G. Lake, and he looked at me and he said, who? And I said, you don't even know who founded your entire movement? And he had no idea. And then he, he stopped. He said, you know, we're not really into the past. We're really about the future. And I said, but if you don't know where you came from, how do you know you're going in the right direction? So one of the things I uh, realized is that I often tell stories of the past, but of course I'm preaching a sermon, so I'm only throwing it in as a little point. But what I'm going to do this morning, uh, this will, we're not going to get very far in history, is I am just going to tell stories. The stories are actually the point, and then we will make applications uh, as we go, and I want you to be able to uh, understand where we came from as a church and as a fellowship, and we'll learn some lessons along the way. This uh, lesson today... I will, I don't know if I want to do this sequentially each week uh, ultimately, but I will return from time to time and tell more stories. So this is Memorial Stones, and this will be uh, part one. And this Memorial Stones, the title comes from the passage that we're going to read. Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Go ahead and read that. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, just before we get into this, what's going on? They're crossing over into God's will, and very important, God does a miracle, the waters part, and God said, I want you to make memorial stones, pile up some stones, wherever you go in life, I want people to remember what happened in the past? 
because that is going to uh, help you in the future. So that is actually the basis of, of what this lesson is. We're just going to begin. I'm going to talk about some early years. If you are visiting or if you're new to our church, uh, our church was, uh, and our fellowship was founded by uh, my father, my parents, Wayman and Nelda Mitchell uh, were the founders. So I'm just going to tell you stories about their life salvation and early ministry we won't get very far in history today but uh, that's the point i'm not trying to uh, rush this my parents may explain and tell you about their uh, conversion on both sides uh, my parents families they were not church goers they were not christian and uh, they were uh, good raw sinners and uh, and I won't bother telling you stories about their families, but nonetheless, just uh, they were not churchgoers. My parents said, both of them, separately, they said they only ever remember attending church twice their whole lives before salvation. And that was as children. Uh, my dad was taken to a Sunday school maybe two times in his whole life. My mom said basically the same as a child, both of them. So they had no Christian reference points. They had no Christian background uh, of any kind. But my dad said he had uh, a grandfather that was a Methodist lay preacher. You understand in the Methodist church early how they uh, formed, they had preachers that were not full-time they called them lay preachers. And he said that this man would come and would visit him. I, I believe that uh, his, uh, my grandfather, Carrico, I never met him. He was passed away before I was alive. But he said he remembered this, uh, his grandfather coming and visiting them and sitting in the yard with a big Bible and he would pray and read his Bible, and my dad would make the comment, he said his grandfather prayed for him. So think about that, how, how profound. So here's, here's the first lesson from my parents' life I want to give you, and that has to do with the power of prayer. Let's read James 5, verse 16. When a believing person prays, great things happen. Okay, I like this. This is a new century version. When a believing person prays, great things happen. You know what? When you pray, your family can be saved. How many of you can say amen to that? So even though in the natural factors, there's no godly influence in the home, but a believing grandfather prayed... And no doubt, ultimately, that was connected to my father's salvation. And beyond, not just can your family be saved, you never know what you will birth through prayer. I never met my grandfather who prayed, but I thank God for him. Because I am looking out right my oldest sister, Terry. And so they're just starting out in, in life, and their daughter... Terry, she died suddenly at 10 months old. Today we would call that crib death or sudden infant de death syndrome, probably. So they're just starting in life. Uh, my dad is 24 years old. Mom would have been about 20, I think. And their baby suddenly dies. They're dirt poor. He had an older brother that was a Christian, a real Christian. George and his wife I owned, they were very good people. And my parents had no money to pay for the funeral, so my uncle George signed a blank check and gave it, this is his youngest brother, Wayman, and said, whatever the funeral costs, you pay for it with that. So now think about this. Here's the second lesson. It's the power of kindness. So we, we evangelize. We street preach. We tell people personally. We invite people for, for that. Never underestimate the power of kindness. I don't think that uh, George and I own were real, 
radical, uh, you know, in-your-face evangelists, but they really loved God. And, and that so moved my parents that they would do that for them that George and I own invited them to church. And here's only the third time in their life that they've ever gone to church and my parents got saved, age 24 and age 20. So here's another lesson. The people you come in contact with in life, sensitivity in a time of need. Knowing that my parents' hearts were broken, they had no answers, is that they reached out to them and they were sensitive to what they were going through. If you pay attention to what's going on in other people's lives, you don't know the impact that you can make. And so George and I own, they were faithful to invite them, but the power of kindness and a sensitivity in time of need. So here they are, they're saved, they responded to an altar called 24 and age 20. Then the next lesson is the power of hospitality. My, uh, uh, my uh, dad said that they, they genuinely got saved, but again, they have no Christian background, they have no concept of how to live as a Christian, they were not coming to church because they had this powerful revelation of living for God and surrendering to the call. But they said that George and Ion, they were kind. And then they said that Ion was a really good cook. And they would say, if you come to church on Sunday, we'll have lunch afterwards. And so dad said, we didn't have a lot of revelation, but we did like Ion's cooking. So they started Coming to church, they had limited revelation. So here's the power of, of hospitality. Food and kindness kept them coming until they got revelation. Now, you cannot feed someone into the kingdom of God. There has to be revelation. But if you are working with someone who's a new convert, sometimes you have to keep them coming. Your job is not to straighten their life out. You've got to keep them coming until God can reveal himself to them. Romans 12, 13. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Okay, this is a, a, a lesson that Paul writes to the believers in Rome. And he says, part of your life is you should be given to hospitality. That means you should express kindness in practical ways. Hospitality, whether that is having people over for dinner or lunch or taking them out for coffee, showing kindness, because that's not just a Christian virtue. Christians be nice. It literally transformed my parents' life because it made it possible for them to keep coming until God got a hold of their hearts. Dad said that when they first started coming to church for the first few months of salvation my father really changed but mom still smoked cigarettes and she came for a while i think she quit a few weeks before she died but no no that's sorry that's that's a that's a joke for my sister rhonda there i threw that in for you rhonda no i am joking okay she did quit <laughs> i think and so <laughs> So, how many of you know that cigarettes are never the actual, nicotine's not the problem. It's people who smoke, it's an unsurrendered heart. They're battling, they're battling whether they're gonna surrender to God. And so, but mom did finally uh, uh, quit. So here's the next lesson, if you're working with new converts, you need patience and revelation to see people changed. I wanna tell you, through the years of observing some people, how they follow up and treat new converts. I thank God that some of you didn't follow up on my parents. Because I see some people, they think you get a new convert and your job is to straighten them out and line them out and tell them off and demand and command in their lives. George and Ion did not do that. 
they were kind to them, they were patient with them, and they prayed for them because you need patience and revelation. Galatians 4, 19. My little children, again I feel the pain of childbirth for you until you truly become like Christ. Okay, if you've ever worked with new converts, you can appreciate this. He's writing to people, they are Christians. But he says it's, it's, it's like a woman going, going through labor is you're not where you should be. There's a struggle going on and he's talking about in prayer until uh, you uh, become like Christ. So you, you have to make sure that they're Christians before you try to make them disciples. That's a lesson. Any disciple here you want to pastor someday, my parents survived because people were patient and waited for God to give revelation. Then dad said in a Sunday morning service, he is really changing. They're starting to really come to church. Whatever was preached, he says he has no idea what was preached, but he answered the altar call, not for salvation, but just to come and pray uh, like we do. He said, as he is down at the altar, someone, he doesn't even know who it was, someone came behind him and simply laid their hand on his back to pray for him. And the moment that they laid hands on their back, he got powerfully filled with the Holy Spirit and he started loudly speaking in tongues. And not just for a few seconds, apparently for 20 minutes or longer, he just kept on loudly speaking in tongues. Actually, everyone, the service finished, everyone left. Dad is still speaking in tongues. They finally told my mom, whenever he's finished, you lock the door as, as you leave. But that marked my father for life. We are a Pentecostal fellowship. We are a Pentecostal church. And so the lesson uh, uh, here is that the Holy Spirit changes everything. Listen, if you have new converts, if, if you want to pray, what should we pray for in our church? The, the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot talk people into changing. If you could talk them into it, then they would have been talked out of their addictions and their problems a long time ago. But the Holy Spirit brings supernatural power and changes everything. Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples, and he said, what you need, if you're going to carry out the will of God, if you're going to survive over time, you need power, supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Then, of course, the ultimate purpose of that is to be witnesses, but you've got to have Holy Spirit power. My parents were tremendously converted from, as I said, having no background of church or salvation at all. Now they are genuinely converted. Think about three marks of genuine conversion that happened in my parents' lives, but this actually has to happen in every genuine convert. Number one, Dad got saved. After he got filled with the Holy Spirit, he wanted to witness. That's a real convert. A real convert wants to tell other people about Jesus. He started witnessing on the job. He would go out on Sunday afternoons with some people from the church to a park in Glendale. They would street preach in, a, in, in the park. They would go... Uh, what they called Skid Row in, in uh, Phoenix. And uh, they would witness to people because dad wanted other people to have what he had. That, that marked his life. He had no interest in playing church games. He did not like church politics. As, it, as he would discover later on, 
He wanted to see people saved. That is why, you know, all over America, and we'll, it won't be till later lessons, the Jesus movement happened in many churches across, uh, across America. Many times people in the church would reject it because these people were sinners. When the Jesus movement happened and started affecting our church, one of the reasons why dad welcomed it so powerfully is because he was a convert. He was not just a cultural Christian, he had been transformed and what he loved more than anything else is I want other people to have what I had. Second mark of conversion is that dad wanted to pray. You have to understand in the, in the church that he was saved in, they had prayer meeting once a week and actually a good part of that time they didn't pray. And by, I'm, I'm just telling you by his description, their idea of a prayer meeting is someone would have a reading from scripture for a few minutes and then they would all turn at their chair and he said basically whoever was leading the meeting would do the praying and everybody else would sit there for a while and they would go home. But dad would, had been powerfully converted. He had problems in his life. He wanted to know God's will. And so he started praying every day. Phoenix, Arizona, they're living there originally in the wintertime in a shed in the backyard. He would go by himself and before work, he would pray. As you know, Phoenix has winter and hell and uh, those are the two seasons. And so obviously it became too hot. They at the time were living with my, uh, my grandma, my, my mom's mom. And he said, this is, there was no air conditioning in that day. The coolest room in the house in, in the summertime was the bathroom. He said he would go into the bathroom, kneel on the tile, put the toilet seat down, and that is where he would pray. And he did that every day. This is, this is where his heart for prayer uh, uh, came. Here's, here's a lesson. Prayer will determine the course of your life. As you know, my father got saved at age 24. He died just before he was 91. For almost 70 years of his life, he prayed every day. He would come in from a trip, he would be in prayer. Before church, if he wasn't counseling, he would be in prayer. Prayer will determine the course of your life. And that is a, a powerful lesson uh, from dad's life. Third mark of conversion is dad wanted to do the will of God. And that is true, a genuine convert. When someone is really touched by Jesus, they may not do this immediately, but when they have been transformed, they want to do God's will. And so he had a desire, God, I want you to use my life. He actually began to think, maybe I am called to preach. He went to uh, his pastor, said, I want to do the will of God. I think maybe I'm called to preach. And so uh, what should I do? And he was given the advice, the only advice they uh, knew at that time, and uh, he attended a Foursquare Gospel Church, and they said, you should go to Bible college. So they uh, moved to Los Angeles, California. He enrolled and attended in Life Bible College, which was the Bible College for the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. My dad worked a job during the day he attended Bible school at night, and then he helped serve in a local church in the Los Angeles area uh, on the weekends. This is very important if you want to understand our fellowship. My father's experiences at Bible college or Bible school taught him lessons that actually shaped our fellowship Later on, he learned some good lessons at Bible school, which he will tell you he learned how to study the Bible. He learned lessons on preaching and, and uh, uh, doctrine. There were good things that he learned at, at Bible college that he acknowledges. But he said, 
attending uh, Bible college, he was one of the few converts in the Bible college. According to him, most of the students that he attended classes were, they were not sinners who got saved. They were church kids, mostly that their parents were afraid they were going to get in trouble or they already were in trouble and they thought if we send them to Bible college, that will keep them on track or some of them thought going to Bible college will save them. And dad said this is, it is different. He is powerfully saved from sin. They're nice church kids who already are getting off track or, uh, or they were worried about it. He said out of his entire class, I don't, don't remember the number of students that were there. He said through the years he kept track, only four of them actually became pastors, full-time pastors. Some of them you know, taught worship or you know, led worship or did various things in helping in church. But as far as becoming a pastor, only four out of that class because they weren't there for the same reasons uh, that, that he was. But my father said there were many negative lessons that he learned at uh, Bible college. He said many of his professors believed false doctrine and taught false doctrine. Some of them were anti-Pentecostal. Imagine this, they're teaching in a Pentecostal college and they're teaching against Pentecost. So he said these were the lessons that he learned. He said he remembers very clearly there was a class on divine healing and he said another teacher heard the professor teaching on divine healing and stuck his head in the door and said, but we don't believe that anymore. And so he said this was the, kind of the uh, atmosphere that he was uh, up against. He said the man uh, in charge of hiring new professors, I don't know if that's called a dean or what the man's title was, he was a Calvinist. He believed once saved, always saved. And so because he was in charge of hiring, he said many of the professors that he hired were Calvinist. They believed in eternal security and this is what they began teaching and uh, 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 putting out. So he said he actually, because he didn't believe that and he had a, a good head on his shoulders, he said, I actually spent much of my time in Bible college fighting against false doctrine. He refused that. He fought against it. He said that's, that's not true. But overall, he came away with an understanding, and this is actually foundational to our fellowship. In later years, he felt the entire premise of Bible college is flawed to begin with. It's incorrect. He said, number one, Bible college is flawed in its approach. Two main problems with Bible college. Number one is that it took people, it took students away from ministry and connection with people. Working with people, interaction with people, is one of the greatest training grounds for ministry. If you think about it, pastoring is all about people. How well you interact, how well you inspire and lead, on and on. It has to do with people. So he said the premise that you lock people away in a classroom, give them Bible knowledge, but then when you put them out into the real world, in our calling, working with sinners, working with people problems, he said, they're, you know what, through the years, I've now pastored for 37 years, I have never dealt with a raw sinner, I've never dealt with a drug addict or a gangster or someone deep in sin who has ever asked for my ministry credentials. <laughs> never. So Dad said, that, that doesn't make sense. The second thing is, 
the idea that you qualify for ministry based on academics, but you're missing character. You know, it's theoretically possible you could be a serial killer, but if you can graduate, if you can pass the academic test, you could qualify as a pastor. I'm, I'm using extreme, of course, but just in case you're wondering there. Right? So character, you could be you could be immoral, you could be a thief, you could be beating your wife, you could be a terrible person, but you're good at book learning, then you qualify as a pastor. And then, of course, the, what he saw as the flaw of Bible college is demonstrated usefulness is missing. In other words, as a pastor, in, when I am working with men who say they want to preach, I am not giving them IQ tests. Are you the smartest? That's not the issue. What I'm looking for is demonstrated usefulness. Are they fruitful? Are they good with new converts and following up? Do they have people skills? That is what I'm looking for. And then you get a guy, I want to preach. It's like, but everybody hates you. Right? You get in fight with everyone. That's not going to work as a pastor. You don't have demonstrated usefulness. You've never won a soul. You never work with converts. Right? So, Dad said the premise, that's what he finally came to. He said the entire premise is flawed in its approach. The second thing he, the conclusion he came to is that Bible college is actually unbiblical. See, the Jews had rabbinical schools. They had Bible schools. They had scripture schools, we should say. But Jesus Christ, God on, uh, in the flesh, did not use the Jewish method of scripture schools. He deliberately did not. What he did is he discipled the Bible says he had disciples, learners, but how did he train them? Hands on. And it was involvement in actual ministry with people. They did the baptizing. He sent them to minister to people. You distribute the food. There were life experiences. So my father he said, the idea of going away to school to become a pastor, I don't see that in the Bible. That's not accurate. He saw a, uh, a book. Uh, some of you may have read it. You can track it down. It's called The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert E. Coleman. When my father read that book, he said it rang true because there are some principles that we still use to this day. He said... Somehow, what this man is talking about, that is actually what we need to do to train men, but he didn't know how. He didn't understand it, but this was fundamental. My father made a statement many, many times through the years. He's, he was a Bible school graduate. He actually did get a degree in theology, but he said, I didn't graduate Bible college. I barely survived Bible college with my soul. And so that is a fundamental lesson. This shaped him so that when God began to give our church revival, we'll get to that in a later lesson, he said Bible school is not how we are going to train uh, our men. There's a, another lesson I want to give you from my parents' lives, and that is God is in charge of your life. Remember, you often hear me make two statements, foundations of my life. My heavenly father loves me very much. Lesson number two is God is smarter than I am. In the wisdom of God, as it is seen in my parents' lives, you see that God is in charge. When God plans something for you, in, he is actively involved. He arranges what you think are coincidence. People will come into your life. Circumstances will happen. You just think it's life, but it is actually God at work. Let me give you a couple uh, examples. 
Los Angeles, California, they lived in a uh, uh, house that was divided uh, in half, A and B. The lady who lived next door to them, the wife became friends with my mom. Later on, after they uh, graduated, left LA, uh, mom heard that that lady uh, had divorced. This lady met a man from Holland, married him later on, and moved to Holland. In later years, they made contact again, and out of someone they knew from their past, in the 1950s, in 19, I think, 77, met up with this couple who by this time were living in Holland, a little place called Steinweg in, in Holland outside Zwolle. And uh, this man had been getting young people saved. We have churches in Holland today because of someone that came into my parents' life in the 50s. So you think about that. How many stories like this, God is in charge of your life. Uh, another one is uh, in Bible college. There was a student that he made uh, friends with. His name was John Metzler. John's daughter, Jolene, goes here. His uh, grandson is Brian Nicely uh, in our church. John Metzler had a great impact on my father's uh, uh, ministry. They were good friends. But uh, the opening stages of the Prescott Church, foundational. Those are lessons for another time. I'll tell you stories in a, in a later lesson. But John Metzler, just happening to, happening to meet him, he came into his life and there was something that was deposited and, and very, very helpful because of that. He went to a church. He attended the Foursquare Church in Phoenix, Arizona. A man that he went to church with, I think it was actually later on, if I remember right, he didn't go to church with them before he went to Bible college, but he did when he came back from Bible college. This man's name was Fred Cowan. Fred Cowan did become a, a, a pastor and uh, later on became a missionary to Perth, West Australia to minister to the savages uh, in, in Perth. That one's for you, Lisa. And uh, <laughs> so he uh, pastored and, and uh, uh, kind of was an overseer in Perth, West Australia. And in 1977, he invited uh, my parents to come to Australia and invited Dad to preach. And so Dad did. He went in 1977. I, I think he spent almost a month in in West Australia, preaching around the church, churches. It was connection with this man who God put him in his life that opened the door to Australia. It absolutely changed the course of my parents' lives and ministry. I'll tell you stories about that later on. I have, uh, my wife is one of those savages from West Australia. I married her and tamed her. And uh, my life was transformed because of someone that God put in my father's life. I'm telling you, God is in charge. After my parents graduated, uh, or after dad graduated, my parents returned to Phoenix, Arizona, back to their home church. And uh, he served for a short time, I don't know how long, but he served as a youth pastor in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. So, let me give you a lesson, and this is foundational. The absolute necessity of conversion. When he came back to Phoenix now, he's a youth pastor ministering to youth. There was a powerful lesson that dad learned, and he said in later churches that he took, he said his battle was often mostly with unconverted church kids. He said they were cultural Christians. They had been raised in church. They knew the language. They had never been dramatically saved, even though they attended church. He said 
Those were his biggest battles because if they got genuine converts, immediately the unconverted church kids would influence them away from serving. And so dad said, you cannot build a church on cultural Christians. Converts are the foundation. I don't remember if it was a while back I preached a sermon and I asked just out of curiosity, how many of you have been saved either in our church or in our fellowship? Lift your hand. Okay, I don't know if you understand how powerful that is. The vast majority of people in any of our fellowship church are converts. And dad said, you cannot build. We are not trying to get people from other churches, nor is it sufficient that our kids attend church. They have to be saved. That is a, that's a profound uh, lesson. 1960, he was offered the pastorate of the church in the mighty metropolis of Wickenburg, Arizona. And he said uh, at its peak, it was 3,000 people. I don't know if that was uh, in the winter uh, at its highest, but he took over the, the church. Two lessons that we'll, we'll uh, only have time for today. And the first of those in Wickenburg had to do with identifying with Pentecost. In the 1950s and the 1960s, Pentecostal churches were viewed with suspicion. And the, the term Pentecostal, you know, you're holy rollers, you roll in the aisles, you swing from the chandeliers, all kinds of crazy things. So what would happen is there were pastors who were Pentecostal, but they didn't want to identify as Pentecostal. Dad said when he took over the church in Wickenburg, a previous pastor, he had the church sign said full gospel church. And full gospel was a way of saying we're Pentecostal without the label of being Pentecostal. But he had a couple come and hold some revival meetings. It was a husband and wife team, you know, in Foursquare they had women pastors. And so he had a husband and wife team, the Westbergs. They came and held a, a revival. Remember, there was no prayer meetings before church, but he said when they had... The Westbergs come for revival. Before church, they came early. They would go on stage, turn the, uh, the chairs around, and they would pray. And he said they would pray in tongues, and they prayed loud. They were bold about being Pentecostal. And he said then in their ministry, they, the gifts of the Spirit were in operation. This so impressed my father he said he went and changed the church sign. He painted over it and he wrote Pentecostal Church. The, forevermore, he said, we are Pentecostal. That is profound. And finally, in Wickenburg, he learned a lesson on the power of dominion. Dominion is the right to rule or who determines what happens here? The Wickenburg Church had always struggled financially. Never in their history had they ever been able to support a pastor. The pastor always worked a job. The church always struggled to pay their bills. He said one day, you know, he had prayed about this, but he said one day he got mad about that. He said, that's not right. He went by himself into the tiny building in Wickenburg and he said he prayed loudly, devil, get your hands off the finances that God has ordained to be in this church. He prayed that first thing in the morning. Within an hour, there was a knock on the door. A woman was standing there from the church, and she said to my mom, she handed her an envelope. She said, I was sitting at home, and I realized we sold some land, and we never tithed. And in that envelope was 11 $100 bills. $1,100 in 1960 was a lot of money. A little while later, another knock on the door, and a lady said, God reminded me that there's some things that we have never tithed, handed another envelope with $300 in it. And so dad learned a lesson about dominion. In life, some of the things that you are wrestling with personally, that may be in money, that might be in fruitfulness, might be in your, there's a lot of things you can be wrestling with. 
He said the real thing that has to happen is you have to take dominion. Devil, you are not going to rule. That's part of prayer. Prayer is not just asking God, pretty please, would you help us? It's a battle. And when you rise up and take dominion, he said that, that marked him for life. He said that's the job of every believer is we are to take dominion. And so these are some of the early lessons from my parents' life. Matthew 16, verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, this is uh, when Jesus talks about the church built into the church, the idea of the church, the gathering of people, is the idea of spiritual authority keys. Whoever holds the keys determines what can and cannot happen. Unlock doors, lock doors, that's keys. So they're pictures of authority and Jesus said, if you want to do my will, I'm giving you keys, you can bind. That's what my dad did, devil, get your hand, you stop blocking the finances and loose is let it be released. The good things that God has planned, let it be released into our lives. Those are lessons of dominion. Okay, we're gonna stop there. We have a wedding, so we'll stop a little bit early. Uh, I'll do uh, further lessons in the future. We're only up to 1960 now, so this could take a while. So <laughs> anyway, I, I hope that you enjoyed that and we'll uh, take this up in further lessons. God bless you. Service will start at 1030.